Thought Park and Legoland. So it's all yours, Don. Hi. Well, really great to uh, to speak to everybody, um, and I hope that uh, you're all having a great day. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about my career, uh, just to give you a bit of a better understanding of what an engineer can possibly do. Um, first of all, oh, hello, PowerPoint's not working. There we go. Uh, many people ask me, "What is an engineer?" Because I'm an engineer, and they don't always understand exactly what that means. And uh, when I turn the question around on them and ask them, this is what they come up with. Generally, they're thinking about sort of a mechanic that you might see, somebody that might fix your car, or a guy that might come around your house to fix the washing machine because they'll have domestic engineers sign written on the side of their van. Well, absolutely, these, these are technical guys and, and they will fix stuff and they could happily call themselves an engineer. But this very narrow view of engineering is not at all what an engineer can do there's so much more potential than that and so my role at the moment is as the engineering director for merlin entertainments now my remit covers over 130 theme parks and attractions across four continents um, in in more than 27 countries so really quite a lot to uh, to understand from a technical perspective and you can see there some of the brands and some of the parks that maybe you'd have visited with your parents such as Chessington or Legoland, Alton Towers, maybe even Blackpool Tower. Uh, we even have some ski resorts so uh, an awful lot going on and, and so what does an engineer do for that? Well I, I will talk a little bit more about my my role in Merlin later but first of all, I'll perhaps talk about um, how I got here. So, so I didn't start out with this remit that you see there on the, the PowerPoint slide, covering all of those attractions in all of those countries. Um, I, I started out uh, studying mechanical engineering at the University of Bath. And um, I was sponsored by the Royal Air Force. So for the first 23 years of my working life, I was with the military. And I covered loads of aircraft types, and perhaps you'll recognize the, the ones in that sort of top left-hand box there, the Red Arrows. I was the, the chief structural engineer for the, for the Red Arrows fleet of Hawk aircraft for some time. I also worked on the, uh, the C-130s, the Hercules, that you can see on the right-hand side there. And they're deploying their infrared and, and um, heat countermeasures there to, uh, to stop themselves being impacted by a surface-to-air missile. I also covered some of the other larger fleets that you see in the pictures there. So many types of large aircraft and, and many engineers fixing those aircraft. I, I was an engineering manager, so, so I would have a team of between 50 and several hundred engineers who would work on these aircraft to keep them flying and to make sure they were fit for service. My, uh, one of my last roles before I left the Air Force was at Royal Air Force Waddington, where I was the chief engineer and I had all of the, the fleets of the United Kingdom spy planes. So these aircraft are the ones that will fly around gathering data and information. So I'm sure you all use mobile phones and, uh, and, and you all are very connected and perhaps use an awful lot of Twitter, um, Facebook and so on. Well, well, these aircraft will pick up these signals. So, so if, uh, if you are doing something sinister or something naughty, then perhaps the, uh, the, these aircraft would pick up some of those signals and we would better understand uh, the, the plots and schemes that could be going on. Um, we can also find uh, quite interesting things. So that the bottom right-hand picture there is something called a Sentinel aircraft. And the, the big blob that you see underneath that aircraft is a radar. Now, it's called a synthetic aperture radar, which will mean absolutely nothing to you. But if I tell you what it can do, you'll be quite surprised. It's awfully clever. It will fly across a piece of land. So say it's the desert, and one day it will take a map of that desert, then it can fly across that same desert the next day, and it will be able to tell you whether there are any changes. So if somebody has dug a hole and buried an explosive, it will be able to show you and mark that spot so it would allow our, our troops to go and, and find that, uh, that explosive device to, to avoid it causing any harm. So really, really clever piece of equipment. Now, when I left the Air, the Air Force, I wanted to put my uh, engineering skills to good use. And you'd have seen that, that uh, working on aircraft was, was aviation based. But, uh, but at the airport, I wasn't in charge of the engineering of the aircraft. 
I was actually in charge of the engineering at the airport itself. So uh, I'm sure you've all flown out of an airport and, and perhaps gone on holiday somewhere. Well, when you get to the airport, there are many things that you take for granted that, that you probably wouldn't even think of as a type of, of engineering or something that engineers would have had to have something to do with. So from parking your car, perhaps you went in and there was a, a system that allowed you to go into the car park. Perhaps it recognized the number plates on your car and allowed you in as having already paid. Um, you can then get on, on, a, on a bus and, and maybe get a transport to the terminal. And as you go through the terminal, there's the buildings, there's the display boards showing you which aircraft are taking off and which aircraft are landing, so where you need to go. There are the, uh, the, the, um, the baggage check-in desks where your, your baggage will be weighed and then you'll see your suitcase disappear off. Well, that disappears off into a, an a enormous baggage system where there are lots of conveyor belts and controls and sensors that will be able to read the code that's on your label that's been put onto your suitcase and it will make sure that it gets to exactly the right aircraft on time so that it, it, it meets you at your, at your airport for where you're going on holiday. Also, perhaps you took the shuttle. This is at Gatwick Airport, so there's a shuttle in between the two terminals, north and south. And that, that shuttle, you probably noticed, it, it doesn't have a driver. So just imagine all of the types of technology and engineering that you have to have for that inter-terminal shuttle to allow it to operate with no driver. And of course, you have all of the electrics and the air traffic control systems and all of the, the infrastructure, the buildings, the bridges, the runway itself all heavily underlaid by engineering. And I was in charge of all of the teams that kept those facilities running and safe to operate so that you could go on holiday. I was then approached by Merlin Entertainment and, uh, and asked to set up a new function. So although they already had engineering going on at all of their parks to keep the roller coasters going and to keep um, the sea creatures uh, in the sea life centers alive so that you can go and visit them, um, they didn't yet have somebody in charge of all of their engineering across the globe. So they wanted me to set that up. And so uh, I've got a very broad scope currently in Merlin and, and I've talked about aircraft, I've talked about airports, and now within my remit, um, it really discovers anything you could possibly think of from massive wooden roller coasters. So, so this is a, a roller coaster called Colossus, which is over a hundred feet high and, uh, and all made of wood. It's the largest wooden roller coaster in Europe. And it's very scary, I have to say, a massive drop when you first, first go down the lift hill. We've also got Blackpool Tower, and this is a circus that's underneath Blackpool Tower. So if any of you have visited there, you might well have seen this circus. It's the oldest circus in the world, one of the original circuses. And uh, you'll see there that that looks like a fountain. Well, it actually is a fountain, and it was made in Victorian times. And at the end of the performance, all of the, the circus troupe come out of their main circus ring, and the floor sinks. And then water floods in and it turns into this musical fountain for the end of the performance. So really, really interesting and very old engineering to keep that going. We also have our hotels and this is a castle hotel. Um, we have some in this country at Legoland, but, uh, but in most of our Legolands around the world, we ha will have a castle hotel. And you'll see here that this uh, not only looks like a castle, but when you go inside, there are all the sort of features that you would hope to find in a castle and lots of magical rooms. And of course, the engineering to build and to maintain these castles for you to go and sleep in um, consists of very many systems and an awful lot of civil understanding, civil engineering to build, to build the hotel itself. We also have our rapids rides. So, so this is where um, you, you'll get on a boat and it goes down a, a, a bubbling river and, uh, and you're, you're sat, sat inside the, the boats there and you're moved around the river and through various conveyor belts. Um, understanding the way the water moves and the pumps that are needed to keep those boats going and to make sure that you have a, an exciting trip around the river, but not so exciting that it's scary. And here we have a great big teddy bear. Now this teddy bear is in Legoland, Japan, and he is made of Lego bricks. So the amount of engineering required to understand how to keep him together, and also to make sure he stands up and the likes of you can perhaps climb on him to have a picture taken um, is interesting because he is eight feet high. So he's taller than even your mum or your dad. He's absolutely enormous. The biggest teddy bear that I've ever seen for sure. 
And here we have a, a hydraulic system. So I don't know if any of you would have been to Thorpe Park or to Alton Towers. Now at Thorpe Park, we have what's called a launch roller coaster. And this launches from naught to 100 meters per second in less than three seconds. So it absolutely ejects you out really fast and it takes you up and over what's called a top hat. So it goes 30 meters in the air and takes you over the top. And this is the hydraulic system that powers that. And, and it, it's the size of a small minivan. It's absolutely huge. And if I compare that to the hydraulic systems we had on the aircraft to move the aircraft controls, you could have fitted one of those on your desk at school quite easily. So this is really something very different and very unique. Um, and such a similar system is used in Rita, the Queen of Speed, the, the launch coaster that we have up at Alton Towers. We also have, for those of you that are Strictly fans, I don't know if you or your parents are watching Strictly Come Dancing at the moment, but this is the ballroom at Blackpool. And, and that is, is part of my remit as well. So you can just imagine the, the sort of um, upkeep and tender care that this beautiful old ornate building requires to make sure that it stays safe and it's able to be used for, for generations to come. And of course, for all those Strictly fans. We have here a lift. So, so this particular lift is actually in the London Dungeon. So I don't know if any of you have been to the London Dungeons, but this lift here looks quite boring. But I tell you, if you go into the dungeons, you'll go onto a boat ride and the boat takes you through a dark channel. And partway through that dark channel, all of a sudden, you're lifted up 10 feet in the air. And this is the lift that will do that. It will take you in your boat from one level to another level. I just mentioned Blackpool Ballroom, but of course it, it's connected to the tower. And this is the, the massive Blackpool Tower. And this, this is quite an interesting piece of structure because not only was it uh, built in the Victorian era, but it's also entirely made of steel. And, and if any of you um, know at all about rust, so I don't know if any of you have seen a car and it's gone a little bit brown and a bit crumbly, that's rust. And, and that happens when salt gets onto bare metal. So you can imagine that, that keeping on top of this tower and making sure that it doesn't rust and it doesn't crumble away so that it's, it, can, uh, it can continue standing for many more years to come is quite a challenge. We also have the very iconic London Eye, which I'm sure many of you will have at least seen. It's on the news most days in the, in the credits, but, uh, but you might well have been on it as well. And this was a, a very unique structure that was uh, put up for the millennium in the year 2000. And it's still being used today, uh, even though it only had an original design life of 10 years. So we're having to do a lot of engineering to, to understand how, how it will endure over time. And now this design has been taken and many such eyes or similar eyes have been built around the world. And uh, one of the biggest eyes is uh, shortly to be opened in Dubai, which is actually twice the size of this London eye. And finally, we're coming to some of our more iconic rides. So the Smiler, you will probably have heard of, and this is at Alton Towers. And this has got the most number of inversions in the UK. A truly, truly um, scary or exciting and exhilarating ride if you've been on it. And keeping those roller coasters going and, and making sure that they can continue around the track year after year is a challenge in itself. I mentioned earlier on the, the sea creatures. So we have many sea life centers around the world. And of course, they, they're used to living in the ocean. So, so they need a saltwater environment and they also need the water to be oxygenated and then they need to be able to survive as though this was the sea itself. So keeping the infrastructure together to allow that to happen is quite tricky. And uh, you'll see the Perspex tank there. That Perspex tank is over a feet a, a foot thick uh, for its walls. So, uh, so ensuring that all those sea creatures stay in and the amount of pressure built up by those thousands of gallons of seawater stay safe is really very interesting. We have some ski resorts as well. Now, I know that doesn't look like a ski resort because it's not very snowy, but this is actually in the summertime because to, uh, to undertake the engineering activity, it can't be covered in snow. You have to do it when there's no snow there. And these ski resorts are actually in Australia. So, uh, so super hot there, but super cold during the winter. Um, they get a good three months of skiing. And um, we've actually just replaced several of the ski lifts that we have out there. We also have some fabulous high, high rope activities and zip wires. And again, this is in the Australian, Australian forest in the outback. 
and uh, and you'll see that uh, that connecting this sort of infrastructure to ancient trees is really quite demanding and quite tricky but it's there now for everybody to enjoy and you may well have been onto one of our roller coasters that's got, that's got a virtual reality. And some of you perhaps have this at home where you put a headset on and you're literally in a different world and you can interact with that different world. Well, this is Galactica. It was a roller coaster called Air, but we put this virtual reality overlay on it. And now you can fly into space and, uh, and it really is absolutely phenomenal. So in terms of engineering then, I've talked about lots of exciting things there, but I think the point that I'm trying to make is that engineering covers so many things. My degree was as a mechanical engineer, and I started out in aviation, so becoming an aeronautical engineer. I then went via the airport with mechanical, electrical, civils, and infrastructure engineering, and now I'm at Merlin, and I literally cover so many different types of engineering that, uh, that I, I frankly lose count because there, there are so many pieces of equipment that I look after and it, it takes so many different disciplines. But, but I think the important thing to understand is that once you've studied to become an engineer, the basic principles of engineering are exactly that, they're basic principles. So you can really truly apply them to so many things. So how do you become an engineer then? Well, first of all, you need to pick the right subjects at school. And so clearly you're in a very good place to do that. So we talk about science, technology, engineering and maths. So your, your basic maths, physics, chemistry, all of those science subjects. Maybe you have some engineering or technical design, technical drawing subjects that you can select. Um, if, you, if you pick those, then you can study. And, uh, and you can then choose it after you've done perhaps your GCSEs, you can make a choice whether you wish to continue um, down the sort of more theoretical path and study for A-levels and perhaps go on to university to do a degree in many different disciplines, civil, mechanical, electrical, aeronautical. Um, or if you wanted to get straight into work and study and learn, um, study and learn, at the, um, sorry, learn and work at the same time, you could become an apprentice. And there are so many engineering companies that have apprenticeship schemes running. And, and we, in fact, have apprenticeship schemes here in Merlin for leisure and entertainment engineering. So really, it's horses for courses. If you like to get your hands on, go for an apprenticeship. If you like theory and learning, and perhaps the difference might be, do you want to design the space shuttle or an airplane? Or do you want to maintain it and fix it and keep it flying? Um, if you want to maintain it, fix it and keep it flying, perhaps the practical route is for you. If you want to design it then maybe the more theoretical route as i said i i studied engineering at university so so i went the, the theory side but i'm in charge of maintenance activity so um so yeah you, you don't have to necessarily pick the one that uh, is a theory or a practical you can perhaps do a hybrid but either way choose something that you enjoy so i asked at the beginning what an engineer was Hopefully I've shown you it's not just the guy that comes and fixes the washing machine. It can be so much more. Uh, and I think importantly, though, it's somebody who can make a difference to so many things. Um, you can be creative, definitely adventurous. And you'll have seen from my career that I've well and truly traveled the world. And I think that you can apply it anywhere. Uh, I have engineers literally working in every single continent. And, and I think that uh, engineering principles are applicable everywhere. It, it doesn't change whichever country you're working in. So, so it's a really good subject to pick if you fancy global travel. It's challenging, so, uh, so you've got to be up for a challenge, but exciting at the same time. And it, it pays well, which I think is always an interesting thing to, to, to make sure everybody understands. And generally, engineering graduates earn a third more than graduates in other subjects. So, um, so very important in this day and age, I think, to understand that it's a well-paid job. But I guess the question is, could it be you? So I'm happy to take any questions now that, uh, that anybody might have. Great, thank you, Dawn. It's wonderful once again. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, please could you use the chat facility to type them in, teachers, and um, Dawn will then read them out and give her answers.
I think they're, they're coming through now, Don. Can you, can you, can you see those? Oh, yes. So, yeah. yes. So, from, uh, oh, here we go. From Georgetown Primary. Oh, gosh, they're coming so thick and fast, I can't read them now. <laughs> from Georgetown Primary, it was what inspired me to become an engineer? Um, to be frank, uh, I, I wasn't really inspired to become an engineer, but I wanted to go to university. And the only subjects that could receive sponsorship at university at the time I applied were engineering. And because I was good at science and maths, I chose engineering so I could get paid to go to university. Uh, I've now got one from St. Catherine's College. Um, oh, sorry, they've gone. And uh, Benfield side says, what's the oldest roller coaster I have seen? Well, actually, the, the wooden roller coaster at Blackpool, which isn't one of Merlin's, but, uh, but it was the, one of the original roller coasters, and I believe it's over 50 years old. And the good thing with a wooden roller coaster is that you can replace individual bits of wood uh, all the time. So, uh, so you know, although the, the initial roller coaster in the design was very old, the components of it are now still really new. Uh, within Merlin, we have um, some older roller coasters, and, and I've got one that's um, 25 years old out in Florida, uh, but, uh, but that has recently had new trains put on it. So, so although it, it's old, it, part of it's a really new. We've got one from Stoke Minster Primary. What's the favorite ride that I have designed? Um, I love the redesign of Colossus out in Hyder Park. So you'll have seen the um, one of the first pictures that I showed was Colossus, the big wooden roller coaster. That's now had a big beast put over the track which breathes fire. So it, it replicates the Wicker Man that we put in at Alton Towers uh, over a year ago. Uh, and I think that's great because it's a wooden roller coaster and it's breathing fire, which is fabulous. I've uh, got one from St. Bartholomew's. Uh, what's the biggest roller coaster that we've built? Well, again, that's Colossus because that's, that's over 100 feet um, high, which is extraordinarily large. It's a, a really big lift to begin with. Um, which, so one from Woodside Primary, which theme park has been the most exciting so far? Um, well, I, I love Alton Towers because it's got such a great selection of roller coasters. But uh, I also love Legoland Florida because it's next to um, a, a beautiful body of water where they do water skiing and it's got a, a, a lovely old um, garden, it's called Cypress Gardens with a really old banyan tree. And uh, the banyan tree is, is a tree that grows and then it, it, um, its roots start to hang down and branches hang down and form new roots. So it just spreads out and it, it's a really magical tree. So yes, I love Legoland Florida. Are there more? Just scroll down. Oh, yes, there are more. Um, so from Sutton Primary, is engineering a fun job for me? And what is my favourite part? Uh, yes, engineering is fun. And um, my favourite part is the variety and the variety of people that I get to deal with. Um, because I, I, I'm, I'm in charge of lots of engineers and they, they all just always stun and amaze me with, uh, with their ingenuity and their creativity. One from Lunt's Heath, how long does it take to build a roller coaster? So from initial concept where we have the, uh, the creative thought about the type of roller coaster we might want to build to opening is uh, depending on the complexity, so how big it is, is either a two or three year cycle. Um, another one here from Knockmore Primary, what has been my favorite engineering project that I have worked on? Uh, that would have been bringing the A400M aircraft, which is the replacement for the Hercules, into the Air Force just before I left. And um, if any of you have seen it at an air show, it's, it's a big uh, transport aircraft, so it, so it carries quite a lot of equipment or people inside it. But because it's mainly made of carbon fibre, it's really light. So it can actually manoeuvre similar to a fast jet. So if, if you watch it take off, this enormous great aircraft takes off and then it can immediately bank to about 60 degrees. And it's just incredible. It really is stunning. Uh, from Benfield's side school, uh, are we working on any new rides? Yes, we are, but it's a secret, so I can't tell you. And one from St. Bartholomew's, uh, do I like being in an engineer? Yes, I absolutely love it, really. Even though I didn't initially think that I wanted to be an engineer, I've never regretted a single day of it. It's been fabulous. 
from Stoke Minster Primary, what's the tallest ride that we've built? Uh, so it, it's not so much a well, it, it, it is a ride, but it's not a roller coaster, and that would be the Dubai Eye. So um, that that is uh, nearly 300 feet high, the Dubai Eye. So if any of you visit Dubai, you will definitely see it. It's enormous. It's not open yet. But, uh, but yeah, that's the, the biggest structure that, that I've worked on. And uh, when we climbed to the top of it during during its uh, during its um, during it being installed, it was uh, very very high. Trust me. One from Stoke, uh, sorry, one from Benfield side. Um, where am I based? So my office is at Thorpe Park in Surrey. One from St Bede's. Um, how do I think of all of the ideas? I don't, to be fair. So um, we have a, an entire department called Merlin Magic Making, and they are in charge of making the magic. And they have some creative people who come up with all of the wacky ideas. And um, then they speak to me and my team and the projects team, and we tell them whether or not it can be made. Um, so sometimes they come up with things that just cannot be made. They're, they're so wacky, but, uh, but generally we work well together. Um, just scroll down gosh I don't know if I'm gonna get through all of these um, what country am I in now I'm in the UK I'm actually working from home today so this is my home office <laughs> behind me so not very exciting it's West Sussex <laughs> um, one from St Bartholomew's what's the hardest thing that I've built um, and so I, I think the the wooden roller coasters are very difficult to build because the uh, because wood is a natural material. So um, unlike a steel, which you can make to be exactly as you wish it to be, wood has natural aspects to it. So um, you can machine a piece of wood to exactly the, the size and shape you want it, but it might have a natural flaw in it, which will then mean that you end up when you try and install it with a crack. So you have to replace it. So yeah, it can be quite challenging to keep tempering it and, and uh, changing it. Um, one here from Benfield side, what's the most enjoyable thing about your job? Um, I love working with people. So uh, yeah, managing people and trying to get them to be the best they can be, I, I find really rewarding and enjoy that. One from St. Beads, how fun is your job? Very fun, really good, really interesting. Um, that's a repeat, inspired me to become an engineer. I can't tell anybody what rides I'm working on. Um, so from St. Beads, this is an interesting question. How do we know the roller coasters are safe? Well, when we've designed a roller coaster and we work with the roller coaster manufacturers, we go through a, um, an exercise called a failure mode effects analysis, which is a, a long way of saying, we basically think of everything that could possibly go wrong. So anything that could fail, anything that could break. And then we do some analysis to understand how we can either redesign it to prevent it from breaking or how we can make it safe so that that we know when it, it might break so in other words we know the life of, of something so a bit like your um, car battery has a life and then you have to buy a new one and change your battery if you know when that will happen then you can buy it before before it runs out of charge for example so uh, so we do that for the analysis we also do a risk assessment um, of the final design and every single day each ride will have a full safety check and a full technical check so we design it safe we understand any way it can fail, and then we do full, a full set of checks every single day. So safety is always built into the system at every single level. Um, another question from um, Willem first, which is, what is the favorite roller coaster I have worked on? Um, I said already the wooden roller coasters, love those. But, but if I needed to pick another one, I, I think it would be a castle coaster. So I don't know if any of you have been to Legoland, but there's a, a dragon coaster that goes through a castle and there's lots of Lego models. And, and I think it's really nice having an interaction between moving Lego models and, and a roller coaster ride. Um, another question here from Sutton Primary. Where have I traveled to for my engineering role? Literally all over the world. So, um, so when I was in the military, I traveled to maybe not quite so, so uh, exotic and exciting places. So Iraq, Afghanistan, America, Canada, places like that. Since I've been in Merlin, I've been Australia, New Zealand, all through Europe, all through America, China, Asia, Japan, Malaysia, Dubai, the list goes on. Basically that, that map I showed you at the beginning, yeah, everywhere on there. Um, from Stoke Minster, what was the first ride that I ever worked on? Um, 
the first ride that I did analysis on when I first joined Merlin was the London Eye. And this was to, uh, to understand how we would make it last another sort of 20 to 50 years. So, um, so that, that was interesting. Question from Not More Primary. What's the best part of my job? I think I've answered that already, working with the people. Um, that's another repeat. Um, Oh, one from St. Bar Bartholomew's. Are a lot of my friends engineers? Um, yes, some are, but but not all. Um, I also do uh, a lot of outside stuff. So I, I ride when I was in the Air Force, actually not part of my job, but one of my uh, what we call secondary duties was as the chairman of um, RAF equitation. So I used to go um, and compete against the Army and Navy in show jumping and eventing. So I've got lots of horsey friends as well. Um, I've also got lots of friends uh, just to live close by me. So, so yeah, you don't just have to have friends who are engineers, don't worry. Um, so one from Sutton Primary here. I said that I'd worked on the Red Arrows. And when was that? Um, it was quite a while ago, to be fair. It was when I was in my early 30s. So um, sort of year 2000 odd. And, uh, and that was, uh, I only worked on them for two years. And one of the major projects that I did uh, when I was with them, I was in charge of their structures and we changed all of the tail planes. And the reason that we had to do that was if you imagine if you're, you're flying in formation, so you've got the front red arrow and then you've got all of the other planes behind him, the person in the front flies through what we would call clean air. So you've only got the force of the air as, it, as it's flying through the air. But all of the aeroplanes that are behind that lead aircraft have got what we would call disturbed air. So um, because the front aircraft has gone through it, they've got air bouncing and turbulent going over the top of their wings. And they, as they try to stay in formation with that front aircraft, are having to make minor adjustments to their, their, um, their tail plane and their flaps just to keep in the right position. And all of that puts stress and strain on those major airframe components. So, uh, so we had to change out all of the tail planes and understand why we were getting this excessive damage and, um, and what we could do to make sure that the red arrows lasted for many more years. Um, one from Lunt's Heath. How, have I how long have I worked at Merlin? Um, I've worked at Merlin for just coming up for four years now, um, but I am actually leaving next month. So, uh, so I, I've been asked to go and do a new job with National Grid. So I'm joining the board, so becoming one of the, the um, senior leaders or senior managers, executives at National Grid, which, um, as you all know, I hope, takes all of the power and the gas around the United Kingdom and also America. So, yeah, uh, another change of engineering for me, which I'm looking forward to. Um, yeah more people asking about new and exciting rides yes there are new and exciting rides but i can't tell you because it's a secret um one from not more primary do i work on my own or as part of a team um i am part of a team so i lead a team uh, not, uh i have a small team in the united kingdom and then at every single park there's a team of sort of 100 or so engineers um who will report back to me so um sometimes i'm I feel on my own because I'm, I'm in charge and I have to make sure that, uh, that I'm coming up with the policy and the guidelines for everybody to follow. But I'm actually part of a, a massive team, which is fabulous. Um, did I take part in building the teddy bear? Sadly not. No, I would love to build an enormous Lego teddy bear. But we have, um, and actually this, this, is, this is a real job, we have Lego model builders. So at Legoland Windsor and out in Florida and in Malaysia, we have entire factories where all they do is build Lego models. That's their job. They design the Lego models and they build the Lego models. So, um, so you could aspire to be a Lego model builder and come and work. Uh, one from Bensfield, any words of advice for those thinking of going into engineering? Yes, absolutely. Definitely, definitely do it because it's a fabulous job. And think about the, the sort of things that interest you. Um, so it could be a digital technology like your telephones. It could be cars. It could be aircraft. Um, it could be power transmission, anything you like. And um, find companies that, that are doing that and, and ask questions. You know, speak to people like me. Speak to anybody who's already doing engineering to understand um, what the best way of, of getting to do that job that you really want to do is. And, and, it, and if you don't quite know what type of engineering you want to do yet, then um, continue studying sciences and perhaps pick 
a, um, a, a general engineering degree. So, for example, I did mechanical engineering, which is quite a general engineering degree. And from that, as you've seen with my career, you can go on and do any form of engineering afterwards. So even if you're not quite sure what type of engineering you want, and if you want to work on aircraft or cars, or whether you want to I don't know, design medical parts. So, you know, when people get replacement limbs and things, that, that's all engineering. People go into food industry, manufacturing, so many different types of engineering you're not sure what you want to do, do a basic engineering degree, and then you can decide later. And of course, the uh, something that's quite relevant today, climate change, etc. all of the technologies we're going to need to combat climate change and sustainability, that's all types of engineering as well. So yeah, carry on studying sciences, ask lots of questions to figure out what it is that would most interest you. And um, yeah, definitely become an engineer. Uh, another question here, which ride has taken the longest to build? Um, the Dubai Eye, uh, definitely, because it's just so enormous. That's still in construction, it's been in construction for several years now. One from Stoke Minster Primary. Um, what what would I, uh, what would your dream be to design? Well, you know, if, if I could come up with a design for sustainable energy, then that would be amazing. And of course, with my transition to my new job at National Grid, figuring out how we can have sustainable power will, will be part of my role. So yeah, that would be great. Um, one from Lunt's Heath, is anyone else in my family an engineer? Uh, my brother is a car mechanic and my dad is a lorry mechanic. So engineers of the type, but more the sort of engineer that, that I showed you at the beginning. So the, the sort of, you know, if you think of an archetypal engineer, you get a guy with a spanner with lots of greasy hands, that's them. And clearly I'm not a guy with a spanner and I don't think I've ever been greasy because that's not really what I would enjoy doing. So, um, so yeah, I, I, have en I have engineering connections in my family. Um, one from Sutton Primary, does it take me a long time to design structure and the projects? Um, I don't do the design, so the ride manufacturers will do the design. I, I will do the um, maintenance understanding and the, um, the risk assessments and the safety side. So yeah, the, there are many people that go into designing a roller coaster and uh, many, many engineers. Um, each will have a specific role. Um, mine is the overview. Um, one from St Bartholomew's. What's the tallest building I've I've seen? Gosh, well I've been I've been on top of the Empire State Building, but uh, <laughs> clearly that's nothing to do with me. And I don't I can't even remember how tall it is, but it is very tall. Um, but there are plenty of tall buildings in London. Go up to the top of the Shard. That's amazing. Um, and if you can't get up to the top of the Shard, go on the London Eye and, and have a look at all of the fabulous buildings in London. You can see the skyline. It's great. Um, one from St Bede's. Uh, oh, okay, that's the same question about how we know they're set and roller coasters are safe. One from Sutton Primary, how long have I been an engineer? So I, I was um, a little bit ahead of myself at school. So I went to university when I was 17. And so I've been an engineer because uh, I studied engineering at university ever since then. So I would say for 30 years now. One from Stoke Minster Primary. Um, out of all of the jobs, what has been my best moment? Gosh, there's the question. Um, and, and I have to say, I, I think it, it was when we introduced the, the new aircraft into the military and uh, the A400M flew for the first time. Uh, because it was really just so stunning. Just I couldn't could not believe how how manoeuvrable it was, and uh, and getting that feeling when you you've worked on a project for so long, and uh, and then you you get the realization of, of it becoming a reality. I think is great. Um, how many people work in my team? This is from Willem first. Uh, in my central team, I only have six people, but in my broader teams uh, around the globe, uh, I have several thousand. One from Lumps Heath. Um, can I tell you any top secret new rides? No, stop asking about the new rides. I cannot tell you. My lips are sealed. Um, one from St. Beads. What did I want to be when I was younger? I wanted to be a dress designer. I was really good at needlework and I love, I felt I was quite creative and, and I loved fashion. So, and I used to make lots of ball gowns and, and things uh, when I was at school. So yeah, I wanted to be a dress designer. And, and I guess, you know, engineering, because it is creative, is like a, a, a better paid thing, <laughs> better paid way of doing that, because uh, becoming a dress designer, I think is quite tough. Whereas becoming an engineer, um, it, there are far more people that want to employ you. <laughs> and, uh, and you can definitely make more money 
I guess if you were a famous dress designer, you'd make a lot of money, but uh, it's probably more certain becoming an engineer. Um, one from St. Bartholomew's, have I ever worked on a Spitfire? Um, yes, I have, and, um, and Spitfires are fabulous. And uh, we used to have them in the um, RAF um, memorial flight. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it was it was it was only for a day, and I, I wasn't ever in charge of the maintenance of the Spitfires. But they are incredible aircraft. Um, one from Stoke Minster Primary: Have I always been ambitious? Yes, I think so, and, and I think I think it's because I always thought um, whenever I was working, I, I was always thinking that I could do my boss's job better than them. So I always wanted to become my boss. Um, and, and at some point that will have to stop, I think, because otherwise I'll be exhausted. But uh, but generally so far, I've been able to, to work through that. But, but one thing I will say is um, ambition doesn't have to just be getting to the top job. Ambition and, and success, I think, are about doing what it is that you want to do and what makes you happy. So, um, you know, getting a work-life balance is really important. And just because I aspire to be a sort of a chief executive and head, head up a company, not everybody can do that and it wouldn't be right for everybody. Some people would aspire to, uh, to resolve climate change, for example, and design you know, a certain thing that would, that would uh, remedy that. So whatever is your version of success, I think it's up for you to decide. So ambition can take many forms and it, doesn't, it isn't always about getting to the top of whatever it is that you think is the top. Um, it's about making sure you're happy and you do what you want to do. And I think engineering is a brilliant way to do that. Um, one here for um, from St. Beads. How long does it take to build a roller coaster? I think it's anything between two and three years. And uh, next question here, how long are you planning to stay as an engineer? So I'm always going to be an engineer. Uh, my role when I move to National Grid, I'm going to be their change director. So I'm going to uh, drive transformation and change within the company, but, um, but still from a technical perspective. So, uh, so I will always be an engineer. Um, my job title might not have engineer in it like it currently does, but I will always be an engineer. Uh, one from Woodside Primary, what has been the scariest project that we've had to complete? And um, I, I don't think any projects are scary. I think some are more complex. And, uh, and, and so I think the uh, ghost train at Thorpe Park, I don't know if anybody has been on that, but, um, but that was scary just because it was very difficult to get it finished on time because there are very many different components to it. There's some sort of pure mechanical components and there's lots of digital virtual reality overlays there are some sort of sensor pieces going on lots of computer tech um, it's it's very complex and integrated so if any of you have not been on it yet go on it because it's a brilliant ride but uh, but that was uh, scariest in in terms of trying to complete it and i guess it is a scary ride as well so scary from two levels um, one from georgetown primary uh, oh, that's the same question. What's been the most challenging? Um, one from St. Bartholomew's, what's the most annoying thing about my job? Um, I think it's when people say they're going to do something and then don't do it. I find that very annoying because I have so much to, to get done and, and I really need to rely on people to, to do what they say they will do. So a piece of advice, don't, don't commit to something you can't do. Always be realistic in what you agree to do. And if you say you do something, do it or explain why you can't do it and give them the time that you will be able to do it. That's the thing that annoys me the most. Um, one from St. Beads, how do you make things operate by themselves? And, and so I, I guess you're talking about robotics and, and remote things and, and that's with lots of sensors and technology. Um, so the, um, the apparatus can understand where it is and what it's interacting with. So yes, with lots of sensors and, and feedback. Uh, one from Woodside Primary, do I work from Monday to Friday? Um, yes, supposedly, but because I'm in charge of technical safety, uh, I'm sort of always on call. So if there's an issue at a park in Florida, for example, um, you know, that I, I, I will always take a phone call to, uh, to, to help somebody out. So yeah, so Monday to Friday in the office, but, uh, but available on the phone to cover any issues. Um, one from Woodside Primary, how much money can you make as an engineer? Um, plenty, I think, is the answer. That there are graduate jobs from um, sort of 
mid to late 20,000s upwards. And as you move through to become a sort of an intermediate manager, I would say sort of 40 to 50,000. When you get up to the more senior managers, um, anything from 70, 80,000 upwards, depending on the size and scope of your role and what you were doing. So yes, there is plenty of money to be made, but of course you have to work, work hard for it, study hard. Um, uh, one from St. Beads, what's the most expensive thing that I've made? And I've made anything in golds and diamonds. Um, no, it's not really expensive like that. I, I think the more complex things are more expensive. So multi-millions and an aircraft, you know, 20, 30 million, even more, depending on what equipment it has on it. But um, the only things that would be gold are some of the connections. So you, you'll have at the end of, of some um, data cables and, and sensitive cables, you might have a gold connection just because it, it, it will transfer the, the signal so much better so that they might have bits of gold in, but no diamonds. Um, so one from Lance Heath, what tool do I use the most when I'm building? Um, I don't actually build anything. I have people that do that. Um, the thing that I use the most is a computer. Sorry. Um, I think these are repeat questions. Here we go. Um, one from Not More Primary, which is a, a new question. Is there anyone in particular who inspires me in my work? Um, there was a, a an air marshal who I worked for in the Air Force, a chap called Julian Young, who, who is currently one of the chief engineers in the Air Force. And, and he always had a really good work ethic uh, that if he didn't understand something, he would go and see the people that were doing it so that he did understand it. Uh, and I think that I found that very inspirational because that's one of the best ways to, um, to really ensure that things get done and that you're making the right decisions is to go get amongst the engineers that are doing it to understand from their perspective what's happening and, and why it's happening like that. Um, and I think that's about it, actually. I think that's the end of the questions. I think they're repeat questions. So, uh, so pretty good timing, Chris. I think it's excellent timing. Um, so, uh, so we've got um, Knockmore and Sutton. Um, if you have either of you, uh, do you have any more uh, questions for Dom? Um, please ask them now. Otherwise, we we'll we'll call it a day. We'll 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 call it a Tuesday, I think. Um, <laughs> so it looks like. Uh, Probably nothing coming through. So I just want to say thank you, Dawn, once again, uh, another wonderful hour. Um, it's always enjoyable watching. You, you change your presentations like this this time, so um, it, it's enjoyable to look at. I thought you did, no Dan, haven't you? <laughs> oh, I just added a few bits to yeah, update yeah, it. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> um, and then obviously, thank you to Knockmore and Sutton for um, staying on for so long. And uh, obviously, thank you for all the schools that have, have been on and, 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 and now gone. Um, so thank you all very much and uh, I'll, I'll close the meeting down. I'll see you, I'll speak to you later, Don. Thanks then, bye. Okay, bye-bye.